Hi. So we're almost at the inauguration of President Joseph Biden in 2021. And I just want to sort of discuss why I'm making these videos. There haven't been a lot of people in a position where they've seen an empire created within their lifetimes. And also when they've seen that same empire decline in that same lifetime. You can talk about maybe Germany, uh, but Germany was never really an empire. Uh, Hitler invaded uh, Austria, got access to Austria's oil without any resistance. The Austrians continue to speak German today. And from that point in time, was able to roll over a lot of other countries. And that alliance between oil and the military continued all the way up until now. And it, it's, it's still there, you know? So we have this ine inevitable connection and alliance between oil and security. Because of course, security costs money. The military costs money. And one of the reasons that we're in decline is because we think that we can maybe try to divorce the concept of security from the con from simply just a balanced economy. And it's important to realize, you know, let's talk about these things because, you know, if we don't talk about them, and by the way, I, I have no sort of um, expectations that a lot of people are going to be listening to this video in the future. You know, I'm in my 40s and I've only heard a lecture from William Faulkner who won the Nobel Prize for Literature, I've only heard one lecture from him in my entire life. So if I'm not gonna, if I, a so-called intellectual, I'm not going to <laughs> go back and try to listen to William Faulkner, I, I doubt very many people are going to be watching this video, but it's important still to create a record simply because of the unique position that Americans find themselves in today. And as an immigrant, as somebody who's traveled, I'm probably in a better position than most to discuss what's happened. And, you know, we just talked about that sort of, you know, this, the issue of security, of you know, military expansion, or, or I should say adventurism, and the financial sector aiding that expansion uh, without very many checks and balances, which of course leached into the legal system and, you know, so on and so forth. But I don't want to get into some sort of, you know, complicated analysis because I think a lot of other people can do the same thing, can do that for, for you. What the, the point of being in, a, in an empire, people sort of forget what the point is. The point of being in an empire, of living in an empire, is to try to effectuate some sort of personal endeavor, whether it's intellectual, entrepreneurial or otherwise. But the whole idea is that you're in, in an empire and so you get to create the rules and the systems, especially the financial ones, through currency arbitrage or and so on and so forth. And so you can, so, so one of the things that, that you wanted to talk about is the point of being in an empire is to promote individual agency. Another way to say that would be to try to make people's dreams come true in an organic way. If you're trying to make people's dreams come true because you happen to have a lot of debt and you're using that debt within a system in a way that's unsustainable, the end result should be fairly obvious. It wasn't obvious to me or a lot of other people within this country because after the fall of the Soviet Union, after the fall of the United States, uh, you know, competitive threat, it really did seem as if all of our ideal, ideas and ideals were superior to the opposition. And that's another lesson that we ought to sort of pick up. Namely, that the greatest problem you can have is having no enemies, no legitimate enemies, because it gives you a sense of confidence that is guaranteed to devolve into arrogance. So again, somebody else can do that analysis for you. The point of an empire is to give its citizens a superior advantage in 
generating creativity because of all these other systems. If you're not able to do that, there's no point in being an empire. At that point, you're simply, you simply have advantages that are guaranteed to fail over time. And so one of the things that I've learned when I was traveling is that you, know, you don't really need that much stuff. And if you, if you think about wealth, you know, a lot of the wealth in the West was created because of housing prices going up. And that's actually how it, it works. It has worked across the board. So that's important to understand because if you buy a big house, you have to keep up with it. You start to fill, fill it up with stuff you probably don't need. Now, I'm not somebody who is suggesting that we should stop buying more things. I'm not part of the uh, recycle, reuse cult. And I, I, even though I am somebody who is in favor of regulation of, of, any, of any company that has what's called, what are called externalities, you know, namely, you know, whether it's climate change, uh, financial meltdowns, and so on and so forth. You know, when I come back from traveling, and I've only, you know, when I come back, I've only got two backpacks with me and I've been hand washing my clothes for six months or more. First thing I do for the next two months is I buy a lot of stuff online. Maybe, you know, every day. Not, not, not expensive things, but still, you know, quite a few things. So one of the advantages of being in an empire is you can do that. You can get what are supposed to be the best stuff. So when people in the United States are trying to convince others to become less materialistic, the other lesson we want to pick up is that that philosophy doesn't work. The point of being in an empire is that you are able to be materialistic. The check and balance should be a sort of a secondary suffix Namely, you should be materialistic, but within reason. In other words, if you're using debt to buy all the things you don't need, if you're using debt to inflate housing prices through interest rates that are preternaturally low, it's not going to work, at least not over a long period of time. And this is important because if you don't have a sustainable system, what ends up happening is all you do at that point is fossilize segregation. In other words, there are winners and losers within the system. A lot of it, and a lot of it is not based on merit, it's based on timing and access to information. So you can imagine the downfalls to all of this, and namely a guaranteed outcome of inequality. Again, a lot of other economists have already talked about this, but what they haven't done is they haven't quite put it all together in a way that makes sense. And if you're a good teacher, you know you can't spell it out for your students. You have to sort of give them sort of breadcrumbs and allow people to pick it up, pick it up themselves, pick them up themselves and create their own, I don't want to say philosophy, but uh, an, an analytical framework. And the reason for that is because the analysis changes over time. And that's one of the reasons why it's important to create a, create a record. Because what I'm saying today uh, has probably been said multiple times by other people, but in different ways. And so we have all these lessons we've been talking about, but we've sort of missed out on the primary lesson. And what's happened here is that we've sort of forgotten that it's just because we're in a better position to facilitate our dreams, our personal endeavors, it doesn't mean that we're actually going to create an economic structure that allows us to do that in a sustainable way. So we've created all these sorts of, you know, corollary bodies that are supposed to help us keep things in check, and all of them have failed, which is again a sign of decline. The journalists and the lawyers, the judges, and so on and so forth. Part of that again goes back to the fact that if you have segregation, which is in and of itself based on an economy that is misusing debt, 
what ends up happening here is that the story of, of the, the immortal story of human greed generates the natural, a, a natural outcome. The same outcome that has been the problem for all the other empires before us. And so what I want you to think about isn't, I want you to think about how, not necessarily how to stop that kind of replication, that kind of repeat of history, because you probably won't be able to do that. If, if, if human nature has stayed fairly constant, trying to come up with a better system of lawyers or a better system of media is probably not gonna work. And this is something that's, that should be quite shocking to you because I was online the other day trying to find out, trying to find a city in America that met my specifications. And I have my own weird list. Uh, I won't bore you with it. But all the cities that met my specifications were under, almost all of them were under 100,000 people. And I realized that, I, I realized why. Because if you have a country that's based on segregation, you know, the, the, the only sort of way out is a system that isn't big enough to justify segregation. In other words, that's a system that's limited by its own physical, I guess, limitations. And so you start to look at things differently when you realize that little quirk. So suddenly having a bigger house, having a house that's, I believe, about twice as big uh, as a house in the 1950s, just 70 years ago, suddenly that doesn't look like progress anymore. But it certainly would if you talk to an American, including, including myself, 20 years ago, as evidence that the United States system both political, economic, and social, was superior to the competition. And of course, any American that's been keeping track of China's ability to uplift a middle class has been humbled significantly in his, his or her lifetime. So I, I was online and it just struck me that you know, the, none of the data matched up. And so what I want you to, the other lesson you might want to pick up is that the data is only as good as the sociology behind it. In other words, the anecdotes, the anecdotal evidence that will tell you how we got to that situation. Because I was actually looking at a couple of cities. One of them was St. Louis. Now on paper, St. Louis is actually a, a remarkable, a, a successful city. But it turns out that St. Louis is actually an, an independent city. So if you try to compare a city that has a different legal structure with another city, especially if all the other cities are under a different legal structure, that data doesn't help you at all. So when you have a large body and a large population in that geographic area, you can't rely on data anymore. Because all the data, assuming you live in a somewhat free country that allows local governments to experiment, all that data is out of context in some way, whether based on different legal structures or based on physical limitations. And so the data in my case was only working when the physical limitations allowed, or, well, not guaranteed, but allowed context. And if you take a step back, all the cities I was looking at, almost all of them were not diverse. And one of the things you notice when you travel is how small the population of the United States is. The United States has a tiny population. One of our largest cities here, and I've talked about this before, I am in fact in one of the largest cities in America, but it only has about a million people. In contrast, a Chinese city, today, uh, that would be considered to, you know, quite small. It's not uncommon for China to have cities of five to 10 million people, <sighs> which tells you that they've done a good job economically because you can't have that many people spread out over different cities unless you have a, at least a somewhat fair or workable 
economic system. So you look at all this, all these different factors that went into segregation that then created different outcomes that then made it difficult for everyone to talk to each other in order to come up with a solution that works, that works across borders. Now, borders are, are both physical and digital. Uh, I was in Mexico uh, last month and I went to a district called Santa Fe in Mexico City. The Santa Fe district is basically the, basically the Beverly Hills, the richest district in Mexico City. And I was able to use my app on my mobile phone to make a purchase. In other words, I have a, an American mobile phone and I was able to go to a different country and then use that mobile phone to make a transaction, which meant that the facility in the, in the foreign country had to be able to have a similar infrastructure and also banking cooperation that allowed the app on my mobile phone to make a currency conversion seamlessly. Now, again, in the same city, I can't do that in any other district. I can only do it in the richest district in that city. And that also happens to be the district that did a fairly good job collecting taxes uh, compared on different apps. Uh, and fees compared to other cities, which tells you again that overall the system in place to the extent that it's been successful has for the most part favored at least up until now it's favored countries and cities and even cities within countries and districts within cities within other countries that have latched themselves on to a to the dominant technological standard, which then allows them to link their systems to a somewhat secure banking system, which then props itself up through debt. Remember that we just talked about the fact that the United States is in decline because it's basically misused debt. Now, you can see how that has consequences for everyone else as well. And you can see why after 1991, the United States had no competition because all those other countries that the Soviet Union treated in a similar way, putting them on their standards, whether legal or technological, all of them were because of, of the failure to create a system that was sustainable when confronted with competition, all those systems were replaced with probably something different or an American system that placed a lot of those countries in debt in American currency. Which again, goes back to what empires really do, which is provide security both financial and otherwise, under a sustainable system that is supposed to be superior in helping citizens realize their own personal endeavors. So what happened between 1991 and 2021? What actually happened was that a lot of other countries managed to copy the United States. They were able to figure out what made the United States successful and piggyback off of a lot of the factors that we were able to make, were able to popularize. And the real problem with an empire isn't only the tendency to use debt as a kind of turbocharger, an economic turbocharger. The real problem, if you really want to think about it, the real problem is that it's very similar to online security. If you have a vendor that's linked to a main database, even if that vendor is not actually part of your database, is not part of the company that's hosting the central database, somebody can hack into that into your central database through that third party vendor. If you think about what an empire really is, it's trying to link all these smaller countries into a central database. And just like hacking, the system itself is fundamentally insecure and can be manipulated both financially and otherwise.
And because you're sort of caught in this debt trap, I don't know, I don't know what you want to call it. You can you can probably call it a uh, a suicide pact to the extent that debt is not used properly. If you're in that position, in other words, if the, when the empire is declining, those debt systems, those debt-driven systems, begin to look like a suicide pact. Because remember that even though you have a centralized database, the vendor, that, that centralized database is only as secure as your weakest point. Because when you have a system, let's talk about travel again. Uh, when I travel, I'm taking a US passport with a chip that's under US standards and I'm going to a different country. If that country does not have a US based system to scan my passport, you know, my technology isn't really all that useful. So what an, what an empire is supposed to do is it's supposed to transfer its security systems to another country and then create a kind of a mutual dependency that improves the infrastructure. And in the past, when the infrastructure was not digital, that system seemed to work. If you go into Northern Africa, you'll see English and French roundabouts. And that's not a coincidence. And I'm not suggesting that that sort of colonial influence was based on compassion. It was based strictly on business, on being able to create essentially a, a, an indirect takeover of a foreign government in order to facilitate trade in the dominant country's currency. But the reason the empire worked, at least under Eisenhower, all the way up to a certain point, the reason it worked was because in the old days, if you go to a place that was colonized by Europeans, for the most part, say Northern Africa would be one example, that place has fallen into disrepair. Not for lack of trying. Uh, the French favored a lot of Baroque designs. And so when you go into Northern Africa or anywhere the Napoleon family uh, happened to be, you, it's quite obvious because the designs are unlike anywhere else. And now the French took over from the Spanish and then right up until Vietnam in the 1950s and 60s, the United States took over those security obligations from either the British or the French. And Vietnam, of course, was a French so-called protectorate. Now, what you see is that in places where you didn't have that system of oil and security mutuality, such as in Northern Africa, there's natural gas, but that's something that's more of a recent phenomenon. You'll see that what the French built has fallen into disrepair, but because it's finite, because buildings are finite, they degrade over time. They also allow someone else to come in and improve upon them fairly easily. In other words, you don't have that centralized database that's got a thousand different weak points that are difficult to fix without cutting them off completely. And if you've ever done computer coding, you realize that you know, you're know oftentimes building on top of somebody else's code. In other words, the chances of you building something from scratch, unless you're part of a dominant technology company, are almost zero. So that's why the digital revolution was supposed to be a, a game changer because it would build upon something secure upon an inherently insecure digital infrastructure that was designed to be insecure to facilitate communication between the weakest link and the strongest link. Now, I believe I was talking about the colonial aspect and physical infrastructure. And when you look at Eisenhower, when you go to places like South Vietnam, you'll notice that you'll, you'll see a lot of you know, bridges, you'll see a lot of things that don't necessarily exist in other countries that were not colonized by a foreign military power. Let's take the Philippines. Uh, the richest area in the Philippines is a place called the Fort, Fort Bonifacio. Well, as the name indicates, it is a military base that is connected and funded by the United States for the most part. And the United States took over from Spain, which is interesting because the United States in the South was colonized by Spain. I'm in a city today called San Jose, which is a Spanish name. The Spanish empire went down, French took over, sold off the land to the United States. Now, 
when you look at the old ways, it was much easier to, to facilitate a harmonious exchange. Because if you have to come in and there's to a new place and there's no bridge, and suddenly now you have an opportunity to build a bridge, both literally, literally and figuratively, and it's not that hard to build a bridge compared to changing or creating a digital infrastructure. It's, it's counterintuitive. You would think that something digital would be cheaper. But when you think about the fact that you have to link all these vendors into a centralized database, it becomes much more difficult. Now, some people like me say, well, just keep all the data localized. And I'm not, an, I'm not a computer expert, so I don't know why that hasn't been already been done. It's probably because, you know, when you localize the data, you make it harder for the central database to know what's going on. And so you can facilitate, you can actually, so you can draw your own conclusions and align between a server-based system to governance as well, right? If you have a government, a central government that allows local governments to harvest and protect their own data without letting the central government peek into it, you can see how corruption and, and decay would be easier in the absence of integrity and checks and balances from a, a different source. Perhaps not, not an independent source, but a different source. So again, over a large geographic body, that's always been the problem is the local the centralized governments have always had issues trying to keep local governments in check even though in many cases we realize the local governments are the ones that are more likely to come up with creative or interesting solutions to problems because oftentimes a centralized government gets too comfortable and begins to simply increase prices without any sort of improvement over time. And that's precisely why you have that acceptance of, of, a, of a flaw within the governance system, which smaller entities, whether it's Singapore or a small city in the US, you, don't, you may not have the best infrastructure, whether it's digital or otherwise, but what you have is a community that acts together to create the same checks and balances informally that, that would otherwise exist. So if I file a complaint online here, it goes to a state database. Uh, it doesn't really seem to be followed. No, nobody follows up, at least not within the government systems. Because in this case, you know, you, you would think that if you file a complaint against a corporation, you would think that the government agency in charge of investigating would at least assign you a number. In other words, send you a number. Turns out that's not the case. You have to follow up by phone. <laughs> and just to see if they got, got your complaint. That's not the case with private corporations that have bought third party auditors uh, to, to protect whistleblowers. And in those cases, if, you've got, if you try to go to a private company, and, or if you go to a private company's website, there's usually what's called a whistleblower hotline or a way to submit a complaint online. And if you do that, there is a complaint and they even tell you to follow up. Here's, here's how you follow up in five days. So you see how the system of attenuation was supposed to create more independence. And you see how, and you see why it works in private corporations because they don't have unlimited debt. If they don't fix that problem, they can't take a, take a loss and take a loan perpetually. But governments are considered to be independent. Uh, sorry, infinite. They're not, so as a result, there's always a tendency to let the debt take over in order to move forward. And in this case, in this country, that's proven disastrous. Because all it's done since World War II is lead to both segregation and inequality. And then as a result of that inequality, segregation becomes something easier to justify. So, we can try to circle back and remember that in an empire, ultimately you're still doing all the same things that you would do in, a, in another country. You want shelter, you want food, and you probably want some free time and perhaps a family. And remember that you can do this anywhere for the most part, for the most part course your choices would be far less in a non-empire 
But fundamentally, you see that empires, when you take away their values, when you take away that ability to elevate the citizens, when you take away that idealism, funny, all, of it, all of that's left is the ability to do the same things everyone else can do, but at higher prices, within a more unequal, perhaps a more unequal environment, assuming that that system is not directly linked or indirectly linked to the centralized empire. Now, you can of course see how, I don't want to make this into an economic structure, but you can see how once you link it to a centralized empire's system, you're tapping into that centralized empire's currency. And so suddenly you're essentially in, in a position where you're not necessarily in control of how your debt, of how much your debt costs and how do you service that debt. And so as a result, your wages, of course, become more unequal as the empire reaches out in order to change the culture in a foreign country by changing the systems in order to facilitate smoother transitions and smoother communications, but primarily in a one, primarily in one direction, back to the empire. And again, if you're Eisenhower, if you're somebody that has integrity, you build all these other systems around that exchange in order to facilitate mutual progress under the idea that the safest country is one that gets along with its neighbors, not just next door, but all over the world. And I think Eisenhower knew that. The current crop politicians may think they understand that concept, and they certainly do, but they don't understand all the other concepts that go along with it, because a lot of them are lawyers. And if you know anything about lawyers, you know they don't understand economics. If you know anything about economics, uh, e economists, you know they don't understand lawyers or the law. And so, if you try to build all these other institutions around that debt banking system of currency differentials, currency differences, uh, that create an unfair advantage for one party. That's when you have all the best things about America, both here and abroad. Primarily colleges, movies. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think here because the number of these things, have, the number of these items has, has declined. Uh, community centers, parks, uh, preservation of, of endangered species, uh, nature reserves, books, and so on and so forth. Now, incredibly, we haven't done a good job in terms of facilitating translations. You can't, if you, my actually, my, my primary complaint being part of this empire is that its translations have been terrible. I've actually had to rely on the EU, on the European movies and translations and captions in order to figure out what's going on in foreign countries. Part of that is because you know, the EU, they're all neighbors, right? So if you're France, France is next door to Spain, it's easier to facilitate that cross-border cooperation linguistically. But if you're, you know, if you're the United States and you, you're, and you depend on Taiwan or Chinese Taipei or Formosa, depending on the name, uh, you, you've got a problem because the people that are in that country lost the Chinese revolution and essentially fled to Taiwan as a result. And if those are going to be the people that facilitate your linguistic knowledge, you can see how there would be a problem. And this has happened all over the world. But you see how the EU, to the extent that it maintains a stable currency, you can, and, and has piggybacked off of the United States technology, you can see how, you know, you can see how over time, the EU suddenly has a natural advantage not an inevitable advantage, but you can see how it has a natural advantage today compared to the United States, which is now, if you think about, you know, allies like Taiwan scattered all, scattered all over the globe that were created because of that original oil and security system or arrangement that I talked about earlier, you can see how when the United States has not imported oil from Saudi Arabia for the first time in decades recently, and 
you know, has become energy independent for the first time, truly energy independent for the first time in decades. You can see how suddenly that sea-based system becomes inferior to a land-based system where the where a competitor has spent the last several decades trying to harmonize processes and in the process of doing so gains ground in terms of translation. And if you think about the United States, we're a country in the middle of nowhere. And I was speaking to a friend of mine today and he was asking if I wanted to stay in the United States. And my response was, you know, listen, if you want to be in the West, if you want to be in a country that has Western values, why not? I mean, why not just go to Canada or Scotland? What's, what advantage does this country have over the competition now? And of course, Canada is, is a neighbor, uh, but it's also linked to the EU or was linked to Europe uh, through the Commonwealth. So if you're here and you're trying to study what to do and what not to do, you want to look at a couple of things. And, and you know, primarily, you want to try to realize that the minute that you're an empire, you're going to fail. Because the concept of being an empire, which involves foisting your culture through, on others through debt in order to harmonize economic systems, in order to spread your system, your standards, in order to make things easier under a single dominant standard. In order to do that, you have to, on some level, wipe out the culture of the other country and create any inequality in the short term if you have access to debt. And this is where we understand why China has been a bit more successful in creating a middle class compared to the, to, to the US, at least recently. In other words, it was, it was not spending its money trying to facilitate these sorts of cultural exchanges overseas among distant allies. And that actually is something that inhibits China today. Most people do not speak Chinese. They probably don't know the difference between Tai you know, Taiwanese and Chinese. Most Americans, if they see somebody here of Chinese descent, do, do not understand that the person is not from China. Most likely the person is from Taiwan. Again, because of that security arrangement. So overall, if you're looking at the future, and people always like to make predictions about the future, China seems to be on the right path economically. It seems to be on the right path economically. The question is whether or not, well, the question is how it's going to project its culture and whether it's going to be successful in doing so. The Chinese government might say, you know, we may, like every other country, be dependent on resources from, from other countries, but we were colonized and therefore we, look extent, we, we don't look favorably on this idea of cultural exchanges because we consider it to be a part of imperialism. And that balance, whether or not China achieves that balance between projecting its story and its language overseas and preventing itself from making the same mistakes as the American empire, that will be the story to watch. And that's actually one of the reasons I like Singapore so much. I like Singapore because it's, it's a combination of everything all over the world. It's a tiny country. Remember that a tiny country has those in those checks and balances internally because of its own physical limitations. And look at Singapore, 20% immigrant population, uh, just all the accoutrements of the West. If you want to go to McDonald's, they have it. Uh, if you want an iPhone, they have it. You can also get a Huawei phone, a Chinese phone. You can also get a South Korean phone because it's linked to an Asian uh, trading platform. It's linked to a trade agreement in Asia. And last year, that it, the countries in Asia, including, including Australia, signed a, another trade agreement that makes it even easier to ship products to each other.
So all over the world, you can see these transactions being made in ways that leave the United States behind. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think that if you look at Germany, which we talked about being not quite a failed empire, but it's just a failed country that was dependent on oil in order to succeed militarily on a military basis. If you look at Germany and you go there today, you notice that you don't see a whole lot of German flags, right? People don't really come out and say they're proud to be German. The chancellor isn't flashy at all. And in fact, Germany has a lot of reasons to be proud today to be German. It's accepted more refugees than the United States. Um, it has a system in place that allow people, allows people to trust each other a little bit more. It's done a much better job in education and as a result has managed to hold on to its manufacturing base. Uh, you look around, it's got world-class companies. My hearing aid, for the most part, is going to be either German or from the Netherlands, not the United States. So overall, the goal of the United States right now as part of, a, of an empire in decline is probably to study Germany and try to figure out what we need to do to make people in this country ashamed to say that they're proud to be American. Or at least reluctant to say that. And just to sort of try to imagine themselves as modern day Germans. How do you create a more sustainable economic structure that doesn't exploit your neighbors? And how do you create a political class that is able to have enough credibility to get things done while not leaving any segment of the population too far behind to catch up. So that seems to be the quest, or perhaps the overall lesson in 2021, Asia is the future. The United States has a lot of work to do. It's going to have to try to look at Germany a country that it conquered and defeated less than, you know, less than 75 years ago um, in order to, about 75 years ago, in order to improve upon itself. It probably wants to study Japan as well, which is now more successful than the United States, economically and culturally and so on. Of course, it's got similar problems, right? That centralized database, infects everyone, all the vendors as well. Uh, it's got similar problems regarding overpopulation, sorry, underpopulation um, and consolidation of, uh, of progress. So in other words, Tokyo is light years ahead of most places in the whole world, uh, but also <laughs> within Japan, Tokyo is light years ahead of, of, of almost every other city uh, within Japan, within, within the same country. So, China is, is obviously on the way up. It's going to have to figure out how to become more like the United States in terms of projecting its culture, but without all the negative associations that the United States has, um, has, has managed to include within the cocktail of what some people might call neo-colonialism. So everyone's got a task to do, and I guess it's up to each individual to try to figure out where they are within this system. And if you're young and you're in the United States, you've got to understand that you're still in an empire. So you can still be in this country, make money and leave. You don't have to stay here. The great thing is that the British, well, you probably want to learn another language. And that's something I didn't do very well. I didn't take my Spanish courses seriously when I was in high school. I think I took, I took one year of French uh, in my final year of high school just to get an easy, an easy class uh, and after having taken three years of Spanish. But you know, it's helpful. So, so, and I, I would suggest traveling more, especially on exchange programs with your school. Because, because remember, the great thing about an empire is it's got all these cultural institutions that can give you opportunities that no one else can. And so if you're in the United States now, you want to think about how to leverage those systems to the schools, the colleges, in a way that's international. You want to save your money? 
and then look outward. Every empire has done the same thing. It's always looked outward as a country, but its citizens have not always had the same opportunity. They've had to take a lot of risks to do the same thing, whether it's traveling on a ship or otherwise, or trying to answer a job posting that roped them in to a job that wasn't what was listed. And if you're an American today, you don't have similar problems, at least not on the same scale. So you can act as an, as an individual empire and look outward and try to create your own mini empire as best as you can.